So hi, yeah, my name is Robin Jan Storm, and this is So You Want to Be a Game Dev Student, an original presentation in 11 acts. First, I'll explain a bit about who I am. Uh, I did four years of programming at the RSA A12 Game Design School. Uh, I then went to the industry, worked there a little bit, and then went to NSUV, Beta University of Applied Sciences. I'm now there as a fourth-year student in the uh, International Game Architecture and Design course as a uh, design and production student, and I'm graduating next month, if everything goes well. Um, I really like working with layouts, mechanics, and gameplay. Uh, I've worked as a producer, as a game designer, and some console titles. I've worked on a wide variety of games, both at companies uh, and at game jams. I was part of the team that won the Global Game Jam 2013 and 2014 in Breda with respectively Rupam and Fru, which the latter of which we also exhibited at E3. Uh, I also wrote a Gamma Sutra article which got featured, and I really like speaking. I like giving talks. I was a speaker at GDC 2014 and GDC 2015, at the Dutch Game Association Day 2014 in Eindhoven, the Independent in Breda, and now at Indie Development. Now, when I'm at events, schools, or meeting other students, I hear the exact same questions, wants, and needs most of the time. Now, I made a lot of mistakes during my time as a student, so hopefully with this presentation, I'd like to give some answers and some tips on what to do and also what not to do. Let's start out. I want to be a good student. Now, with good student, what I mean with that is graduating in four years, not having to do extra time, and having something at the end that you, know, you can try and get a job with. Now, first of all, it's very um, nice to understand that your degree is a bonus for the political system. If you want to move somewhere, if you want to move to a different country, that degree is really, really nice. But nobody in the game industry cares about it. You're there for four years to learn a trade. You're there to learn game design or programming or art and do something with that. But the actual paper you get is only useful for political systems. Now, what I would advise students to do a lot is to be a chameleon. Get to know your lecturers. Get to know every one of them. Because you're going to have to submit a lot of games and a lot of documents to them. Now, games is this very nebulous thing of how you're going to grade this. I mean, a lot of different review sites give wildly different grades for, well, you know, kind of numbers to different kinds of games. So, if you understand your target audience, your lecturers, if you get to know them, get to know what they like, you can adapt and then do you know, work for them that they will like, and you can get a grade you know, and pass in four years. Now by that, I don't mean suck up, I mean adapt to graduate. Just you know, get to know them, adapt them for each one of them. And play by the system's rules. If they ask you to check a lot of boxes and to do all this stuff, then just check those boxes. Even if you don't like them, well, you know, it's too bad, just check them for now, because at least you're gonna be doing everything in four years and not spending too much time. And if you do make something that you really like, or something like, hey, you know what, I think this can go somewhere, submit it to festivals. Like, submit to IGF, submit to like, a maze, or submit to all this other stuff. Because you're going to get a lot of feedback back from the judges, which is nice. And if you get taken, you can get in for free, kind of like me. And if you don't have any money to go there, like to stuff, then, you know, get student funding or a scholarship. I've flown back and forth to America three times, and I haven't paid for a single flight. Why? Because I you know, find places where I can find money. There's never harm in asking. You can just ask around everywhere. I mean, if you don't ask, you're not going to get. And of course, you're also there to learn, not to be perfect. If you make a lot of mistakes now, you might feel really bad about them, and it's not a nice feeling, but it's really, really nice. Because if you make them now, you've got a safety net. You're just a student. It's going to be fine. If you make a mistake in the industry, it's going to cost you $10,000 per mistake. So I'd rather make them earlier than later. I want to make an MMORPG. Okay, so I'm going to be very clear about this. You cannot make an MMORPG while following a game development course. Really, you can't. It's too much work, and the result will be subpar to the other million that are out there anyway. But, I hear you cry out, I have this totally awesome Pokemon MMO idea that nobody has ever done before, and it's going to be totally awesome. Oh yeah, nobody has ever made a Pokemon MMO. And they totally all haven't been terrible because the workload is nuts. And besides, when you put it on your portfolio, Nintendo's going to take it down because you're breaching their IP, so it's not going to be any use anyway. What you can do instead is learn how to code a server. Show that you can have users on it, that you can sh sh send data back and forth. You definitely have to make things in your free time, but don't take on too much responsibility. Scope accordingly to what you can actually make in the time that you have there. I mean, developers' interest in what you made, not what the school forced you to make, 
it's much more interesting to see what you are excited about, what you want to build, than what you know, someone forced you to build. And if you don't know what to do, or how to make it, or where to start, use this website, Sorting Hat. It's made by Zoe Quinn, and it will ask you questions about what kind of game you want to make, 2D or 3D programming, or do you want to do just narrative stuff with text? All that's fine. You can just select it, and at the end, it will give you a list of help and a list of engines that you can use to do that work. And it will also link you to this website, yourgameideaistoobig.com. <laughs> it's very straightforward. You can just tick the boxes, and you can see the number go up, and also especially the time go up. Because making games takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. I mean, all these big companies don't take a lot of time and money just for the fun of it. It actually takes that much. I want to be taken seriously. Now, with this, I mean, well, you're submitting your game idea somewhere, you're talking to other people, and they don't really seem to be listening to you, or they don't really take you seriously with your ideas. Well, the problem is that, is that you need to be recognized before something like that happens easily. Because even successful people are ignored when nobody knows that it's actually them. A great example is this. Someone broke something, and they posted on Reddit that they wanted to fix it, something physical. And someone made a very detailed comment. You can glue it with wood glue and clamp it and perhaps drill a hole and all kinds of stuff. And it was really good and it only got one upvote. Until two years later, the guy did an AMA. It was Adam Savage. And suddenly everyone was like, okay, yeah, this guy actually knows really well how to build stuff. This is really nice. We should listen to him. Now, this is happening at a much smaller scale with you. You might have perfect ideas and perfect solutions. But if nobody knows you, nobody's going to listen, because there's going to be a hundred others who are also unknown, also yelling out the same kinds of things. If you get public approval through awards or recognition in some way, people will listen a lot more. Now, a fantastic way to do this is through game jams, because game jams are covered fairly well in the game's media. So if you can make something in 48 hours and then show it off, it can really get to your advantage. And also remember, for social media, if you want to be taken seriously, on Facebook, if you put your uh, profile on friends only, that doesn't mean only your friends can see it. If any of your hundreds of friends have their profile on public, then anything they like, comment, or share can be seen by anyone on the internet ever. So don't say stupid stuff on social media, because you will regret it. If you need to have a difficult conversation, go to a bar somewhere and then just talk to them over there. Don't say it somewhere where you can read it back four, year, four years later and go, oh, I was such a dunce because you will never know if you've pissed someone off, because they will probably never tell you. I want to work in a team. Now, by this one, it's usually like, well, who do I choose to work with, and where do I meet them? How can I find these people? Well, the people that go to events, right here. These are the people that care. These are the people that want to learn, because they are the ones developing. They want to get better. And if you can't go to events, again, you can find money somewhere, but another good thing is you can go volunteer. You can get in for free. And if you're a student, use the discounts. A lot of you probably already did that. And there's a lot more other events there with really large student discounts. Going to events is a super fast way to learn, meet, and be inspired by other people. And if you find a wide and diverse variety of people to work with, it's going to help with your game. Because if you all have the exact same thoughts all the time, you're going to make a game that's just one static thing. But if a lot of you have completely different ideas about how games should work, or like what kind of thing you know, would, would be nice, then you're going to get this very diverse thing. And of course, you need to have fun with these people as well. Connect with people, connect with your classmates. Because if you're not connecting with any of your classmates and you show them something, they're probably not going to care. But if you know them already, if they're friends with you, it's going to help a lot if you show off stuff there, and then they're going to go, oh yeah, this guy's got a good idea, I know him, this is nice. You need to have fun with people, get to know them, and then showcase your idea, and then see if it sticks. If you're going to go blind, it's going to be about the same problem as a telemarketer has who calls you. You're probably going to say, nope, because you don't know the person. And of course, be aware of different methods. Because I said we work with diverse people and like different ideas for games, but the same working style is, of course, very important. There's people with like very like, standard things like, okay, I want to do this, then this, then this, then this, very technically oriented, and this can work very nicely. You also have people who like, go all over the place and sort of go like, with the flow, and they see and they feel stuff, and that's how it, sort of how it goes. That's totally fine as well. And there's people in the middle. But realize who you're going to work with. Because if you're going to work with a really technical person and a really feely person, you're going to clash a lot. So either find a solution for that, or simply work with someone who is more fit with your style. 
And if you're thinking, well, I don't want to go to real life stuff all, all the time, or you know, I want to do stuff in the other time as well because there's not that many events, go to online forums. Mapcore is this great uh, forum for level designers. If you go on there, you can showcase your work and you know, see other people's work and compare yourself. Or go to Polycount. You can post your work on there as an artist. It's really, really good. Others can critique the work. You can find like-minded people. And if you make a name for yourself by posting cool stuff all the time, people will want to work with you. They'll ask you, like, hey, can you help me out with this project? Because you're making really cool stuff. If you make a name, this will really help. And if you're showcasing work here at Indie Development or anywhere else, or on forums or in your school, never defend your game from feedback. Always take the feedback to be true, even if in that moment you think it's totally not. Because if you think from the perspective of the person giving the feedback now and then refine it uh, later, it will help a lot. You can also just discard all the feedback later. But in that moment, when you're sitting there, you're reading something, take it all to be true. Just write all of it down. Because someone's experience with your game is never false, because it's their experience. A player can feel something is wrong, but not be able to explain why. Because you know, they might not have the expertise to like, know exactly what's going on here. And it's up to you to decide what to use. But you need to take all the feedback. Now, this is really, really difficult. Even for me, I still make that mistake sometimes. Because you're showcasing something that's really yours, and you're really excited about it, and you really like, feel happy about this, and someone suddenly tells you that some stuff of it is wrong. That's really difficult to do. So if you see others do this, then tell them calmly, hey, just you know, take the feedback. Don't defend your game. Just take it for now. You can discard all of it later, but listen to it for now. Just write it down. And of course, if you're giving feedback, critique is always useful, but bring it democratically. The worst thing you can ever say after playing a game with someone who wants feedback from you is, that was good, bye. What was good? Was there something bad about it? Is it a perfect game? No, of course it's not. So you're not saying something. Now, of course, you want to be friends with the person who's showcasing that game, because that might be really nice. But they're going to like you a lot more if you actually tell them what's, what's wrong with the game and what's good with the game. Tell them what you thought of what was good and what was bad. Because if they react badly to hearing such feedback, then that is their problem and not yours. Though, of course, again, you know, don't be a dick about it. Be nice about it. And if they then react bad, well, that's just their problem, not yours. I want to talk to that famous person. So now you're at an event and you see this really cool person and you really, really want to talk to them. Well, here's the thing, don't bug people. You can talk to them, but don't bug them. Because speakers sometimes, especially at big events, just run away immediately because they're going to get swamped by people and they want to take selfies with them and it's kind of awkward at the same time. And none of these people want to tell you to go away because you went to their talk, you're talking to them, you know, if they feel nice about it. But, you know, don't stand there for 10 minutes blabbing their ears off. Don't talk about your whole life story, just say a quick thing. And, you know, of course, you probably already know this, like you don't want to bug some people, but it bears reiteration because I see it all the time. Like, I'm not that famous person that it happens to, but I am one of the people standing there having to wait for 10 minutes for each person to finish their question. And that's very difficult and annoying for everyone involved. So if you see someone, you know, go talk to them, go communicate, but be professional and be quick about it. Talk to them for two minutes or just show a quick video on your tablet, like, hey, this is a the thing. Then get that card and go away again because then you can just email later, and that's perfectly fine. You don't have to talk for them for 30 minutes, unless, of course, you, know, you can both go somewhere and invite you. It's all fine. But don't just like, stand there with 20 people and all ask 10-minute long questions, because no, that's not going to help. You might be like, well, I'm a huge fan, and like, the, you know, the, don't they love me that I'm talking to them? Well, some celebrities definitely do. I mean, movie stars are sometimes famous for it. But you're talking to a game developer here. They're probably really nerdy, socially a bit awkward, and not used to being famous millionaires anyway. So please, you know, don't bug people. I mean, I, again, still make that mistake sometimes, so please, keep remembering it. Also, isn't Ryan Gosling so dreamy? Yeah. Oh, and when you do get the business card, don't send long emails. This is one I sent once. I still feel stupid about it. Don't say with a mail like, oh, I'm this and this, and I did all this stuff, and I'm currently this and that, and thinking about this, which made me ask you uh, what, when, and how, and why, and could you please tell me because I love your work and all this stuff and this and that, and thanks, goodbye. No one's going to reply to that, especially not someone who gets 100 emails a day. Yeah, 100 a day. So instead say, hey, I'm this, asking this, thank you very much, goodbye. Because then you're going to send one email, you're going to get one back with one sentence, and you're going to send again one, with one sentence. And then you're going to actually communicate and actually get something going. 
I want to be a game designer. Okay, so this is fantastic. You want to work in games. Games is really, really, really fun. You want to be a level designer or a narrative designer. But let's have a talk with anyone really in the industry, from another country even, maybe. So what does you say you want to do here? I want to be a level designer. Uh, so you want to block out areas and uh, white box them? Well, yes, but I also want it to look nice. Uh, so you're an environment artist. Well, no, I play around with the gameplay and the enemies. Wait, so you want to do combat design? Well, sort of. I create the story by combining all of those elements. So you're a narrative designer. No, I'm a level designer. Okay, so what do you want to do? Like, really want to do? Because there are a lot of options. There are so many things you can do. There's not just programmer, artist, and designer. Ask yourself, which part of the game do I want to make for the rest of my life? Because there are so many options. This is a list I got from The Door Problem by Liz Eglint. I would suggest Googling it later. Because you need to be aware of all the options. There is no need to stick with it forever, but if you're just starting out or you're a student right now, be aware of what you can work towards. Because if you can find something that you can work towards, it's going to help you out a lot. And if you find a job, go find a book. You can just buy books everywhere on the internet. It's really easy. Just Google the thing that you want to do, find a book, and read it. Now, for the many things, for example, for programmers, you can be a gameplay programmer, an AI programmer, a network programmer, a release engineer, a core engine programmer, tools programmer, level designers, UI designers, combat designers, system designers, monetization designers, QA testers. There might even be jobs that you haven't even thought of, like UX or usability researcher, localization, producer, publisher, CEO, PR, community manager. You might not even have thought of these things, but you can work towards something you like. And of course, be aware that after four years or after three years, your, that job that you, you know, were focused on might have just disappeared. The game development community changes very quickly. When I started out, there were no VR jobs. Oculus hadn't started the Kickstarter. That was in my second year when that started. It's now been three years, and suddenly there's VR jobs everywhere. Brand new ones might appear all the time. So stay in the flow of the game industry. Stay in contact. Read Gamma Sutra. Read like business websites as well, not just like Game and Foreign Game Fought and Kotaku. And of course, read those to understand what games are great at like, but also read the business websites, because you're going to find out about a lot of good stuff. Always be learning about this industry. I want to work in the industry. OK, so the industry is kind of a nebulous thing. Which one do you want to work in? Do you want to work in indie? Do you want to wear many different hats and learn all kinds of different things and you know, do stuff yourself or work with small teams of two or three people? Or do you want to go into AAA, one, wear one really cool, really high-tech hat and it's going to be totally awesome and you specialize in one thing very well and everyone wants to work with you because you're so good at that one thing? Or do you want to go into academics and wear your hat backwards? <laughs> this is the head of I get, Will Davis. He's an awesome, awesome guy. Absolutely fantastic. Now, if you want to go into academics, you need to get good grades, and you need to do a lot of research, and that kind of stuff. Now, all of these three are fine, and there's stuff in between them as well, but look at them right now, not at the end, not when you graduated. Look at it now, when you're a student, because it's going to be really, really difficult to change once you've graduated. Because once you've graduated, you need to get a job, and your portfolio is going to look the way it's, look, it's looking, and that's the stuff you, have, you had done the last four years. Also, I'm so sorry I couldn't find a picture of Will with a wolf, so this will have to do. <laughs> of course, if you want to go on internships, contact inside a company is always better than the regular address. Companies always get hundreds of emails every day asking for an internship. And if you want to be early, or if you want to go international, you need to be very, very early, especially for the US. And of course, you also need to be like really, really, really good, but you also need to you know, be early. And the company has to pay a lot of money for you to intern there. Like visa requirements for the US, for example, are really, really expensive. And you also need to pay a lot of money to live there, because the US is not cheap. So, you know, be aware of that. It's going to cost you a lot of money. And when you're a student, or right after graduating, don't expect a lot of money just because you're in the game industry. You might make a lot of money, and it might be really nice, but you probably won't, so don't expect it. I want to have the best portfolio. Or rather, the question you're usually, giving at, usually given at events of, hey, can you please look at my portfolio? 
And that's very nice, having people look at your portfolio and kind of looking like, hey, is this a good thing that I have this on there? This is going to work out. But everyone has a completely different idea about what a good portfolio looks like. Every single company has different requirements. But you do have to make your portfolio now. If you're starting out and thinking like, well, I make my portfolio when I'm going to do my internship, no, make it now, your first year, even if you're not going to you know, send it over anywhere. Because the first game you're going to make is going to suck. The first portfolio you're going to make is also going to suck. If you iterate over on it for three, four years, it's going to be so much better than anyone else's because you didn't make it in the last minute. And you got, of course, have, you can do two things with your portfolio. You can adapt to who you want to be hired by. You can put a lot of stuff on there that you know that other company that you're applying to really, really likes. So you can put all that stuff on there. Or you can just put on there what you like best, apply to a lot of companies, and just see, like, hey, which company has the same ideas, the same likes as you? Both of these approaches are perfectly fine, but you need to select something. Because you need to be conscious of what you're showing and why you're showing it. Why is this on your portfolio? Because you like it or because someone else would like it? Because if you have a mix of both, it's going to be a little bit of a mess. And if you want to be a 3D modeler, do not show off 80% concept art. Show off 3D models. Even if they're less good looking than your concept art, you know, have stuff on that you're applying for. And focus on your personal version of success, that thing that you decided you want to do. Because in, in the long run, your portfolio will then make sense after four years. I want to stand out to recruiters. Well, standing out, like, of course, if you have this amazing mod that you make or, made, or this amazing thing that you made that everyone knows and got really big on Reddit or really big on Otaku, yes, everyone's going to like you and it's probably going to be really good. But there's also a lot of other stuff that you can do, extracurricular activities. For example, you can do theater. You can work with groups of people, and you learn to communicate effectively. As a designer, this is really, really good. As a programmer, an absolute must. If, as a programmer, you can communicate effectively in your team, everyone is going to love you. And for book clubs, there's great knowledge that's in people, and they're now dead. But they wrote down everything they learned. So read about it. You don't have to make the same mistakes that they did 400 years ago. You can just you know, do the same kind of thing. And writing groups, you want to write narrative? Then just, you know, write narrative. Just do it. Make a Facebook group. Just, you know, put stuff on there. Let other people critique it. Go make a Facebook group with other narrative people and just work together. Write stuff, read stuff, and just do this. Nothing's stopping you. And of course, the absolute best extracurricular activity there is is game jams. Game jams are just absolutely fantastic because you can fail without repercussions. These life experience of just Doing stuff helps with everything. So do activities. A really concrete example for this, for artists, is this. Cultivate artistic interest. Learn about the golden ratio. Learn about composition. Learn about the rule of thirds. Drawing, technical drawing, that kind of thing. And then, when you're done with that, learn UVing, learn triangulation, high poly sculpting. It's video game specific skills. You need to stay informed of the wider art world and not just games. Practice to be an artist, not just a game artist. And the same goes for designers and programmers. If as a designer you can design a comfortable chair, that's going to help you out with designing other comfortable things too, such as a nice level flow. All these things combined, try to be that person and then work in video games. It's going to help you a lot more in the long run. I want to make video games for a living. That's a hard one. You need a lot of hard work and a lot of luck. I mean, you can work super hard and never get lucky, and you can never work and get really lucky, or you can work hard and get lucky. That last one's the best one. And you can make whatever you like. If you want to con make continually make games, though, you have to survive somehow. There has to be some kind of money. You can do this through sales or DLC or art grants or just government funding. All of that's fine. Everyone has a different way of doing it. But you need to find that balance between what you want to do and how you can survive doing it. And I just found this picture when I googled balance and had a Wikipedia free license. So I figured, why not? I want to be successful. OK, so success is this weird variable. It's different for every single person. It might mean that you just want to survive and make games, and it's fine. Uh, and some people will just want to die for their art. They want to create the stuff that nobody's ever going to play or pay for, but you know, they're fine with making it. Other people want a Lamborghini. All of those are perfectly fine. But all of them center around the same thing. How do you become good at game development? 
Well, there's a similar question, which is, how do you become good at League of Legends? Well, you play a lot of League of Legends. You watch streams of really good people playing League of Legends. You read tactics about what heroes to use and what abilities to use and when. And then you go to events and you work with a team and you make awesome stuff. And then I would say you're a pretty successful League of Legends player. So how do you become good at developing video games? Well, you make a lot of games. You watch streams of people making games. You read tactics about what tools to use and when and how things can go better. And you team up with other people and you go somewhere and you make games. And you know, you will be more good at game development and thus you can probably be more successful. Now, all of the points that I just mentioned, all 11 of them involve making games. You just have to make games as you're a student. I mean, try to publish them somewhere, even if it's something small, and you're probably going to fail a couple few times, but you'll learn a lot more from it. If you're going to publish your very first game, the best thing you've ever made, you're going to make so many mistakes with this game that you really like that you're going to hate yourself for it. So just, you know, do it a couple times. Make all the stuff. So, you know, good luck and make a lot of video games. So one more thing, I want to thank these people for helping me out. Uh, I want to thank these sources and credits for the pictures that I took. And if you want to download the slides, you can use that link, and that was the topic list that I used. Thank you. I fully agree with everything you say. <laughs> thank you very much. There's, there's no end to uh, how often you should sort of review these slides, and there will be a video up later. Um, if, if this didn't really reach you yet, then... then Go through it again and again and again and again until you really, really, <laughs> really know what you're supposed to do. There's time for questions. I haven't seen the next speaker yet, which... Okay, there's one. Can you set up already? Any? Um, so there's room for questions. Are there any questions? And please stand up if you do and speak loudly. It's totally fine. Questions are really nice because you also make the speaker feel nice. And like it creates this connection between people. Because then you're like, oh yeah, this person actually cared. Oh god, thank god. It's at every event, it's like, it worked really nicely. Oh, thank you so much. It's a very good question. Good question. <laughs> Any other? Yes, question? Do companies usually put on their websites what they require from someone's portfolio, what they think is the best to put in there? Blizzard has this really great thing where they do do it, but Blizzard has this specialized website where they do all their applications, and they get thousands, and they really put on there, no, this is the stuff we want, because then can, they can just go delete for every single one of them that didn't follow the guideline. But usually on a website, you can sort of find what they like to do. Like for Blizzard, for example, it's really nice if you put your design process in there. If you, for example, read the blog posts about World of Warcraft level design, those are really nice. It shows the process of what they go through. And if you show the process that you're using and the things that you create, it will help, out, help you out a lot because they can see like, oh, this same kind of process that we're using, this person knows what they're doing. So not every company does that, but the companies that do, just look around on the website, look at blog posts especially, and see how they work. And, you know, post stuff on your portfolio that shows that you can work that way too. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? No? Okay. Yeah. Thank you again. Okay, thank you very much.